back with a more exciting than ever edition of the Starting 502 podcast. My name is Presley Meyer, alongside Jake Hook on the other side of the screen. Jake, we've gotten some good news lately as far as it's been in the works for a while. This is something that Jacob, Jacob Lane and I have always wanted, wanted to do, uh, and, and that's actually having a studio. Uh, the reason we've been able to expand so much, right, is because you can be in your family room or wherever in, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I can be in, in Oldham County, and we can make this thing work. Um, but it is in the plans. I've gotten the clearance from the tower. Uh, the podcast studio is on the way. Uh, so ooh, eventually, ooh. eventually we'll have some maybe some couches, maybe some you know cool lighting, decorations, that sort of stuff. We can do the stuff in person knock it out, do some live streams, that kind of stuff. So a lot of fun stuff in the works. Jake, how are you? I am good. I am 0 for 2 on my March Madness bets so far. Went with Howard and Wagner won and then went with Virginia and they scored 42 points and lost by 25. So I'm, I'm on a bit of a cold streak, but there's always tonight. I've been saying this kind of in jest, but would not even be surprised at this point. If that this is the last that that we're seeing of Virginia's head coach, like I I, I think there's a legitimate chance that that uh why am I blaming you on his name uh, Tony Bennett Tony Bennett thank you um, I oh, tried to forget that name uh, mm -hmm. but this might be the last we see of Tony Bennett um, <laughs> and his run in the NCAA tournament over the last what since 2018 has been fantastic pretty much they lose to a team that they should not lose to or they win the national championship and pretty much no in between. So that's been fun to watch, but I'm with you there. I had Providence last night because I thought that was a team that deserved to get into the tournament and they lost to Boston college. Um, so there's all this we talk. Beat, about. Yeah. Did we No, we didn't beat Boston college. Did we, we almost Ooh, beat them. No, uh, kept it close with Boston college though. That's what, that's a there win in go. this year's book. That's right. That's basically like half a win for us this year. Literally. In all seriousness, no, though I had Providence and I had Virginia, so not a great night for me last night. Mm -hmm. the, Providence filled up their arena for that NIT game. I think they wanted to show like, hey, we deserve to get into the tournament. We're going to show out for these players. And then they just absolutely just came out with a dud. So <laughs> And no. Yeah, and that did not happen. So uh, be, be interesting to see. We've kind of poo-pooed the ACC all season, uh, and everybody, I think, kind of belabored the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee for, you know, not putting in more than three Big East teams. Uh, and then <laughs> and then Providence goes out and loses in the first round in the NIT to uh, kind of bottom level, bottom tier of the ACC Boston College team. So um, fascinating, fascinating stuff. But we have a full show in store for you guys. Some stuff we've been hearing, and we'll get right to it. Um, you know, we have some other stuff we want to get into as far as, you know, maybe filling out our brackets, talking about, you know, potential coaches and, 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 and that sort of thing. But we want to get into what we're hearing because there's a lot of chatter out there and I'll, you know, kind of throw into the fire just a few things that we're hearing maybe from secondary sources, from people who are in the know that, you know, have good connections. Uh, and for some reason they want to tell us this stuff. I don't know, but the one thing that I've consistently been hearing and it makes me feel good a little bit, Jake, is that really our, our, our confirmation or, or, or our, um, our, our, our thoughts that Scott drew not coming to Louisville because of things that seem kind of ridiculous um, are actually kind of being confirmed a little bit. Uh, and, and so what we, if you're a listener, a frequent listener of the podcast, one thing that we got into was Scott Drew's faith and his life off the court and his community that he's developed at Baylor. Uh, so when Scott Drew came to Baylor, everybody knows the story. Everybody knows what happened. Players murdering each other. Uh, the As close to the death penalty as you can get, basically having seven scholarship players. But when he took over there, he you know had just gotten married. He's had kids there. He has three kids. One he just sent off to college, two others that are in high school. Uh, and he has a very strong faith-based community and a lot of people have kind of been poking fun at you know i put out the the highlights with scott drew's favorite band being i think it's called awaken worship 
um, where apparently they actually put out some pretty good Christian bangers, but apparently it's like a live worship thing that people listen to, you know, lots of minivan moms like to listen to in the car, that sort of stuff. Uh, but that's what he said that he likes. And it was kind of a banger, honestly, with the, <laughs> with the dramatic, uh, you know, Christian church theme music going on in the background while Baylor's winning the national title. But that's the kind of guy he is, right? Like he's a guy that, that is just straight up about, you know, this is a, you know, this is God's program. Like he just straight up comes out and says that stuff. And so uh, pretty much a direct quote um, that, that we've heard from multiple people is that Scott Drew is nervous about the bourbon culture in Louisville. Like that's a <laughs> legitimate concern of his. It's a legitimate concern of Scott Drew's that, you know, it, it's not a cultural fit for him, right? If you've been to Waco, Texas, if you know what Baylor's like, like it's a private Christian college, uh, it's not a, a huge town. Like I've said before, very Chip and Joanna. Um, I saw, you know, hit one of his most recent posts uh, on, on social media was, you know, sending his daughter off to college with, with one last visit to Chip and Joanna's place. So uh, it, it's very, <laughs> that's a very real thing. Uh, and, and, and Texas, people that build a life in Texas, they're very protective of that. And to get someone like that to move, um, it, it, it is, is a tall task, but the, the cultural fit is a major factor for this guy. Um, the other thing that, that I can pretty much confirm, Scott Drew ha was offered pretty much Louisville is, is throwing everything at him, right? You know, three or $4 million in, in NIL money, as much as you could possibly, that Louisville could possibly muster to pay him, which would be like eight to $9 million, and apparently this is stuff that Baylor thinks maybe not the NIL stuff, because again, it's a Christian college. People are kind of weary about that kind of stuff in Texas, uh, specifically in a place like Waco. People don't want to be just paying the players. Like there's lots of people who still have conflicting um, thoughts on the, on the moral values behind uh, donating money that would eventually just go back to a player. Like they like the, uh, what college basketball was initially all about, right? They don't like the thought of, of paying players. Um, so that's a concern for Scott Drew. Uh, and that's something that Louisville can absolutely provide. Um, but what's not a concern is, is the salary. I think that's something that Baylor can match. Um, I think it's really just all about what's the best fit for him. If, if he can look at Baylor in 10 years and say, you know, I think I can win another national championship here. I don't see any reason why he would want to move. Uh, and we've had, you know, Eric Crawford, um, the, the, a few national media guys come out and say, you know, they're kind of hearing the writings on the wall. He's going to straight up say no to Louisville. Um, and, and I think that kind of confirms our initial suspicions, Jake, that, you know, people kind of laughed at that and said, oh, we, you know, we have one of the biggest cr or Christian churches in the world, Southeast Christian, uh, right down the street. And we have, you know, a huge faith-based community. Uh, you know, we're a huge Catholic community. Um, but no, I mean, there's there's some real, um, you know, feelings behind that from him. Ultimately, it's about more than just the job. It's about more than just winning championships. It's about his beliefs. And ultimately, I think that's what's going to hold him back. I'm not saying that it's, it's officially no. I'm not saying it's officially off the table or that Louisville's not going to keep throwing the book at him. But I will say that, you know, I, I would say it's it's very unlikely – at this point that Scott drew is the next coach at Louisville. Uh, what, what are your kind of thoughts on that, Jake? Hate to hear it. I started working on the Google doc yesterday and literally very first thing was Scott Drew's still number one and hasn't said no yet. And then all that changed about an hour ago and it hasn't officially been confirmed that he's saying no, but it was reported last night, some guy named Dick Weiss or Dick Weiss. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say that name. Yeah. He's, he's a well-known um, national uh, columnist. So. Yeah, he came out and first said that he had heard Scott Drew said no. And I was like, oh, just one guy. Maybe it's not true. But then the rumors kept kept growing. And then Eric Crawford comes out and says he's hearing the exact same thing. And now we're hearing the exact same thing. So I was pretty confident he was going to say no eventually. But it was nice to have that hope. And I still held out like a 20% chance that he would say yes because $8 million dollars. Three, four million in IL. Like, I mean, it makes sense. You can win at Louisville. It's not 100% certain that he will ever get back to the national championship with Baylor because since that national championship team, it's been a little downhill. So maybe he was seeing the writing on the wall. 
that it wouldn't be possible to do it again. But it seems likely that we're going to have to move down to those B tier, C tier candidates that we talked about a while ago. Yeah, man. And I mean, the, the one positive that Louisville fans should take from this is that Drew hasn't said no. This has been something that he's been open to for a while at multiple stops. Uh, and, you know, I have on pretty good authority. And if you do some digging, it's not really hard to find that, you know, Georgia tried to throw everything at him either last year or the year before. Um, there's some other big name schools uh, that, that tried to do the same, right? That tried to make Scott Drew one of the highest paid coaches in college basketball. I mean, he's already six, but try to make him, you know, competitive with John Calipari, Bill Self. Uh, and he pretty much for the same reason said no. Now, Louisville is in a little bit different of a boat just because I think that when you have that tradition, when you have that passion from the fans, and when you have, you know, when you're looking forward, if he's looking forward at, at his career 10 years from now, what will the landscape of college basketball be like then? This is a guy that's very open to to building his his teams through the transfer portal. That's not something that could be said about, uh, every coach that that we've been talking about, right? And he has really done so through the transfer portal in, in, in recent years. Um, so, with all that in mind, I, I think it's a positive that Louisville's, you know, has that NIL factor in their back pocket. Uh, I think that could make a difference. Um, and you know, if it's something where, you know, it, to me, what it sounds like, it's, it's something where he's very interested in in making a move if it's not something where Baylor makes him the top priority, right? Like he's looking for, he's looking for every reason to stay. And if Baylor provides that, then he's going to stay. But the, I think the positive news that Louisville fan is that he, I, I'm not sure he's blatantly came out and said no, um, but he's, you know, there are a lot of boxes that Louisville would have to check that I'm not sure they're going to. And to hear something like, you know, he's not very supportive of the quote-unquote bourbon culture. I mean, you know, as everybody knows, in the city of Louisville during the summer, <laughs> or even this time of year, you know, we're having fish fries and drinking beer in the church gymnasium. Uh, and over the summer, we'll be gambling and drinking. So <laughs> it, it, the, the culture of Catholicism um, and the culture of, of Louisville, which is a pretty heavy drinking culture, allowing you know having angels envy and and i can't even remember what it is now elijah craig and um you know some vodka sponsorships and that sort of stuff <laughs> very he heavily implemented in the arena um having this be kind of the bourbon epicenter of the world uh that's sounds like that's kind of a huge turn off to him so uh you know i mean for a guy I, again I, I mean he's getting I wonder pumped if, up by yeah ocean, I, I wonder you know? if uh and i doubt this is true but i just wonder if maybe the noise was getting out in Waco. His team starting to hear it. He's got to get them focused for what could be a really deep run in March again for him. They're a three seed playing against Colgate. So part of me does wonder just a little bit, like maybe this is just to silence the rumors right now and be able to focus on his team and not have them concerned about, oh, well, is my coach even going to be here when they're playing against Colgate or when they're playing against New Mexico in the second round? So I am just curious if, if maybe he's just trying to quiet that right now and maybe there's a second look afterwards, especially if they have an early loss to Colgate or a second round loss to New Mexico or whoever else they're going to play in that second round. So I haven't lost all faith yet. I think the my percentages dropped from like 20 to maybe like five or 10, but I still haven't lost all faith just yet until I hear Scott Drew come out and say, I'm not going to Louisville. I'm in the same boat as you, man. And when I look at this, ultimately, you know, I think the reason that Louisville isn't giving up hope either uh if, if that is you know what it turns out to be that they continue pushing for this i think the reason is i mean if you look at the names that are out there there's only seven coaches in the country that are active coaches that have won titles that's number one uh, and, and number two you know he really checks all the boxes for what louisville needs uh, the only thing that i that i would say would be a concern is like like we said that cultural concern you know, he's he's not going to be coddled or babied by the media here. Uh, he's going to be asked tough questions when Louisville loses. Um, he's going to be – he's expectations, you know. Whoever comes in here, as we've talked about, uh, I don't care who it is, my expectation, and I think most fans' expectations, will be that Louisville gets back to the tournament right away. 
Like that's the standard. It doesn't matter how low Kenny Payne took things with the way that college basketball is with the foundation that Louisville has with what Louisville's willing to put on the table. There's absolutely no reason why this can't be, you know, immediately turned around by whoever it is, uh, whether that be even like a Mick Cronin or a, uh, you know, TJ Otzelberger or, or some of these names that have been thrown out there. Uh, you know, Josh shirts. I, I, I think all of those guys, if you brought them in, the expectation should not change. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to get into a little bit that we're hearing, there are two names that have been floated out there a lot that, you know, I, I think that the, the common thought has been that these two guys, like Josh Hurd said, would crawl to Louisville, right? Like they would, they would jump at a chance to be at a place like Louisville. Um, and it's not only because of what Louisville brings on the court, but also off the court stuff as well. Uh, and those two guys are Jerome Tang and Mick Cronin. Uh, I don't think at this point that either of those guys are an option. Um, from everything that I've heard, you know, I've, I saw Crawford put something out on Twitter about he thinks that there, there may be something to the quote unquote loophole. Um, that was started by the bring Brum home guy. That was kind of the, the initial thought there was, Oh, well, you know, when they move to the big 10, there's a loophole. He can get out of that contract. Uh, but from everything that I'm told from everything that I'm hearing, uh, Mick Cronin's buyout is, is, is about as firm as it gets. There's no, you know, there's nothing, there's no wording in that contract. There's no language there. And there, there'd be too many, hoops to jump through too many lawyers involved to get a guy like Mick Cronin to come here. And look, I don't think that's a guy that you jump at to come here. You know, if, if you're looking at, you know, the highest floor, maybe Mick Cronin's a top two guy, top two guy on the list. Right. Because that's a guy he's shown it, with the exception of this year and like one year at Cincinnati in the last 20 years that he, he gets to the tournament. Like that's a guy that will be in the tournament which that's great, but that's not ultimately, you know, five years from now, if Louisville's gone to five tournaments and won one game, that's not the standard. That's not the expectation. And that's the concern I think that you have with Mick Cronin. That's not a guy that's worth a $16 million buyout plus, you know, five, 6 million more uh, in, in salary plus the three to $4 million in NIL. I think that's a guy that's that's out of contention. Now, is he a guy that would crawl here from Los Angeles? I think so. I think there's some stuff off the court that is is wanting him to to get near closer to home. With that being said, though, there's a job open in Michigan that I think that Michigan has that power to money, if you will, um, to to pay a guy like Mick Cronin. I think that he'd do well there. I just don't think it's the right fit or the right time, uh, and not financially. Um, wise to go after a guy like that. And the other guy would be Jerome Tang. Uh, you know, we've heard, you know, Mike, Mike Rutherford said over and over, he doesn't think Tang's the guy. I'm kind of hearing the same thing um, from, from what I know, this is a guy that's reached out to Louisville. There's been communication and for whatever reason, something's kind of thrown Louisville off about Tang. I don't know if it's his background. I don't know if he's not a good interview. I don't know if, if, you know, what, there, there's red flags there. And I don't think Louisville's willing to jump at that. Now, is Jerome Tang willing to to come to Louisville? Absolutely. I think that's a guy that if you picked up the phone and gave her, gave him an offer, he'd say yes right away. Uh, but I, I don't think that's a guy that will end up here. Uh, and so then the, the attention turns to Dusty May, right? So people have been putting out there over the last couple of days that Dusty May seems like, you know, it seems like he's in later talks, in, excuse me, later talks in the process with with Louisville than anybody else has been so far uh, and it seems like it may ultimately be that it's Dusty May's job to turn down now I would ask you Jake you know is that somebody that you feel comfortable with being the coach at Louisville for the next 10 20 years I was first time I heard it Dusty May I was like oh yeah at like very beginning like a few months ago I was like oh yeah FAU coach took him to the final four did a little bit more digging, took him three years to turn FAU around. So that worried me because we we won a quick turnaround here, which obviously it's more difficult to turn around FAU than it is Louisville. 
His recruiting classes have never been higher ranked than a hundredth in the nation in the five years he's been there. So that's another, another concern. And his transfer portal classes have never been higher ranked than 112th. So when I initially made my coaching search list, I think I had him at like eighth or ninth, not because I don't think he's a good coach. Cause he is a good coach. His, his off, he's a very good offensive coach. His defense is pretty hit or miss, which is concerning. But the more I think about it, the more I watch what he's done at FAU and you put it into context, the fact that in the first 25 years of their program before him, they had made it to one tournament and now they've made it to a final four and they'll probably make it to at least the round of 32 this year. That is pretty crazy. That is really, really impressive. And I know the recruiting and the transfer portal hasn't been as great, but this isn't 2008 where you need John Calpari or Kenny Payne or like huge connections to get these players, especially in the transfer portal. What you need is money. And it's very clear that Louisville has that. The number's been thrown out three to $4 million in NIL. And if that is the case, if that's all reserved for basketball for next year or even for the next couple of years, that is plenty of money for Dusty May to come in and be able to get six, seven guys from the transfer portal. And especially he's got three dudes on his team that are juniors this year, his three leading scorers, John L. Davis, Vladislav Golden, and Elijah Martin, they're all juniors. They can just seamlessly come with him. They already know everything there is to know about his system. They've been there. I want to say all three of them have been there every single year that Dusty May has been there. So the more I think about it, it's still, it's not the home run hire, but I think it has the potential to be the home run hire with what he's done at FAU with the NIL that we can offer, with the players that he can instantly bring in, three impact starters that you can bring in, and the fact that he's only 48. That's another thing. He's he's going to be here if, if he's successful for 20 to 25 years, and that's really not anything that can be said about any other coach that's on our list. He, like every other coach is at least 52, 54, I think. So I'm talking myself more into it. He's not Scott Drew, but I, I do think that he's a hire that I can get behind. Yeah, Dusty May, you know, we talked about, you know, historically what Scott Drew's done in the portal, what a guy like Eric Musselman or Jerome Tang or, or, or one of these guys, you know, even a Mick Cronin has done in the portal. Uh, Dusty May historically has not been a guy to go out and grab some some high name, you know, big name prospects, right? Uh, I mean, in you would think it'd be pretty easy to recruit to Boca Raton. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of old people there for a reason. It's, I would go there. It's a, would yeah. Go there. It's a nice place to be. Um, but I will say again, it's FAU and, and to go back to your initial point, Jake, you know, I, I, I just, I'm really comfortable with the way that he's developed that program because, you know, you said turn around. I, I don't really even think it, it's been a turnaround. It's just been a, you know, they were going, they'd, the wrong direction for three decades and he took them and steered them in the right direction uh you know i mean it's been a really a complete 180 if you will of you know the the direction and and overall uh notoriety of, of the school and the program uh you know i mean even if, if you look at their their football program or or anything else in athletics there they're they've always been bottom dwellers wherever they are um so this is you know absolutely something that's it's been unprecedented in their school's history. Uh, and, and, and I think given the opportunity, there's, there's a reason why a school like Indiana really wants a guy like Dusty May uh, because, you know, he, he's a guy that you can see the potential there to, to win national titles. Now, when we talk about that ceiling and floor of Dusty May, that's where I get a little concerned, you know, what, what is what is his ceiling when you put a guy like Dusty May in a conference like the ACC, and he's recruiting against the, these types of teams? You know, he you got to recruit at a top ten, top fifteen level um, to have success uh, in the ACC conference and make consistent deep runs in the NCAA tournament. You know, has he really caught lightning in a bottle with with guys like like uh, John L. Davis, or is it something where he can bring that consistently at Louisville? Um, and and, and I, I do think what you can give Dusty May if he comes to Louisville is a much lower salary, obviously, than what Scott, uh, Scott Drew would make. But you can give him a lot higher salary for his assistant coaching pool. Uh, and, and I think that that's a huge positive. Uh, you know, 
I mean, if, if you're still looking at that same those same type type of numbers for a Dusty May with NIL, you know, I, I think that you could do a lot of damage. And as you suggested, you know, you could take three guys like Davis, like Big Vlad, which if, if you watch any of their highlights, I really like um, Vlad Golden a lot. Uh, if you take two or three of these guys who are juniors who, you know, they had a extremely successful NCAA tournament run last year. Uh, they beat a ton of top name teams. You know, they beat Arizona earlier this season, um, pretty much in, in a road environment. You know, they won in Las Vegas. Um, you know, if, if you look at this team, you know, top to bottom and what their identity is, and you bring some of those players over and then combine them with a guy like a Brandon Huntley Hatfield, like a guy like Sky Clark, all of a sudden, you know, you could have two five star players with three or four guys who are rising seniors who have had great success in the NCAA tournament, who have been, you know, fantastic um, at multiple times in their career. You know, I mean, John L. Davis is a, was an all conference USA player last year. I think he was an all, all um, uh, AAC player this year. Uh, and when you watch their tape, it's pretty impressive. The offense that they run. And I've heard a lot of, qualms about the defense you know they they were 28th nationally defensively last year uh and they plummeted all the way to 185th uh, defensive rating this season but if you look at them at the end of games when it matters the most uh i, I think they defend just fine uh you know when, when the game has been on the line this season if you go back and look at their most important games against like a south florida uh against like i said like an arizona um you know some of these bigger name teams or, you know, I wouldn't say South Florida's bigger name, but, you know, a, a team that's been successful this season. When you look at the end game scenarios, you know, it's the polar opposite of what you saw from Louisville this season. You know, it's, you know, they're, they're locking down. They know their jobs. There's an identity with this team. Um, so there's a lot of promise there, in my opinion. The one thing that I would throw in, though, Indiana, Mike Woodson, they have a coach that is probably close to retirement age. Mike Woodson has been all over the place. He's been not as successful as many hoped at IU. And IU is going to want Dusty May badly, whether it's this year, whether it's in five years. Um, so, you know, that's something to take into consideration as well. You know, Josh Hurd said he wants a guy that's going to be locked in for 20 years. If this is a guy that, say, the IU job opens next season and he's willing to take that leap, you know, <laughs> Do we want to be back in the same scenario next season? I don't know. But what I do know is that I'd like to not be talking about a coaching search this time next year. And I think that Dusty May can be a guy that that would put Louisville in the tournament in year one and give us national championship type of aspirations. Sorry, you cut out right there. What did you say, Bryce? So at the end, I was just saying that I, I think that Dusty May can be a guy that can put Louisville in the NCAA tournament this season. And they can, he can have them in the national championship conversation, have final four national title aspirations once again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think him as a coach really has any question marks. I mean, to do what he has done at FAU is incredibly impressive. I mean, there is no doubt about that. His ability to coach offense has no questions. Top 15 in the nation in 2022, top 17 this year at a school like FAU and they stepped up in difficulty in their conference as well this year. And they still maintain that the defense does have some question marks, but I think that's where if you're only giving him 4 million a year, as opposed to giving him 8 million, like you would Scott drew, then you can go and allocate those funds into an assistant coaching staff, an assistant that's primarily focused on recruiting and then an assistant that's focused more on defense. And that kind of allows you to spend up more as opposed to a Scott drew all that money was going to have to go to him. And he would have still brought brought in a, a fine staff, but I think this gives us a little bit more flexibility there. So I don't really have the concerns with what he would do at Louisville, especially with the NIL that we have. I think the Indiana concern is, is a legitimate one because he's an Indiana guy that he coached there. Is that right? Or is so he from Indiana? So he was actually a um, team manager okay. under... Why am I blanking? Bobby Knight. Okay. Um, so he was never, my understanding is he never had a playing career, but 
his coaching career started very early uh, under, you know, obviously a legend and Bobby Knight. And I'd say his personality is, is far different than what Knight's was, but hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, but, uh, I think you got, you have to trust Josh Hurd here that if he's going to hire Dusty May, that he's going to have that tough conversation that, Hey, if we hire you, you're not going to be looking a hundred miles up the road to Bloomington, Indiana, as soon as that job opens up. And I mean, obviously he can say yes there and then still turn, turn his back on us, but could be another thing Josh Hurd does. He makes that buyout so high that he's almost unapproachable, like a Mick Cronin is with 20 million, 16 million, or like Nate Oates is now that's now that he's got his contract extension, he's back up to nearly 20 million for a buyout. So maybe that's how Josh Hurd gets around it as well. Um, so initially I was hesitant to Dusty May in experience and the inability to recruit and dominate the transfer portal like a Musselman or a Nate Oates has, but you look at the programs they're at the money they have there, the stature of those programs, there's a reason why. And also, the last two years, he didn't have a lot of roster turnaround. The transfer portal is typically out of necessity. If you have a good team that goes to the Final Four and you can keep almost all of those guys, you don't have to go to the transfer portal. So that's why his class is unranked this year. The reason you go to the transfer portal is because you lose three guys to the NBA draft, five to the transfer portal, and injuries or stuff like that, or just graduating seniors. So he just didn't have anyone that needed to fill in spots. So to me, that's a little bit less of a concern. Scott Drew's still the home run hire, but I, I do think Dusty May can be great here and could give us 20 to 25 years of greatness if hired. Yeah, and you you see that, you know, he kind of took over a lot of what Mike White implemented, uh, you know, back in the early 2010s. He was at Louisiana Tech, uh, followed Mike White to Florida, uh, and they were, you know, pretty successful under his – um, you know, under his tenure. And then since he's moved to FAU, he's kind of put his own stamp on things, his own fingerprint on things. Uh, when you, when you watch Dusty May's style of play, it, I think it's, it's a style of play that would excite fans. I think it would, it's something that, that could give us some hope here because it's so polar opposite than what we're used to with, with Kenny Payne the last two years, right? Like there's a, there's a definite identity. Like they look to get out and run, you know, when they, when they get defensive rebounds, there's two, three guys immediately sprinting down the court. And you saw in their final four run teams for whatever reason could not keep up with that. You know, especially teams that, that are, you know, really uh, honing in on trying to grab offensive rebounds. Um, you know, you have one or two really solid rebounders outlet pass and they get things going very quickly. Uh, that, that's not something we've had at all. Um, and then he, he runs a very, um, uh, regimented offense, you know, he's, there is a plan in place. Uh, and, and I think the playbook is pretty deep for Dusty May as well. Uh, and, and his team is very well coached. You know, they don't turn the ball over a lot. Uh, they're solid defensively. Uh, they shoot the ball very well. They take open shots, you know, they take good shots, um, you know, and they scheme up a lot of things to get to the bat, to the basket very easily um so there's a lot to like about what he brings to the table you know it's just about you know how he implements that here what coaching staff he brings with them how many players he can get to come with him and how successful he can be in the transfer portal you know i mean it, like i said you know you take a brandon huntley hatfield sky clark maybe a mike james type of player you add in like a john john l davis and big vlad and that's a starting five right there uh and then you know you go out and get some of these players uh, you know, the transfer portal is open uh, and it's hot and heavy already. Um, we're already seeing that the 502 circle or, or whoever the representatives are for Louisville, there's people already reaching out to players. So even though there's no coaching staff in place, Louisville's doing, you know, whatever it takes to start reaching out, start engaging with players and start getting an idea of, of what uh, the roster makeup could look like. Um, so, uh, yeah, I saw that. Um it was the things Amari Williams from Drexel. Mm -hmm. It said he has a long list. He's got, you know, Arkansas, who's on everybody's list, Alabama, mm -hmm. Texas, all this stuff. And then I saw Lowell's name and I was just like, who is reaching out? Is Josh Hurd conducting a coaching search and also recruiting right now? But I guess that answers it, that it's representatives from the 502 circle. Because I was curious because Josh Hurd was very clear. There's no interim staff right now. There's there's no basketball staff right now. Yeah, I, I don't know what the legalities are there, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're allowed to reach out directly, if they're allowed to reach out on behalf of the university. You know, I know Louisville acknowledges the circle as 
the official partnership. So maybe we get a little bit of clarification on how that works. But I do know that that there's a lot of of studying that goes on behind the scenes. You know, who are guys that could pop in the portal, right? You know, if if you're if if you're a coach who's recruiting, you know that that starts in October, November of, of the previous season. You know, you're watching what players are you know, have the best analytics, who are, who are the players that are, are making the most open or contested shots, who are the best, you know, who, who has the, the highest rebounding plus minus percentage, you know, I don't know exactly what they factor in, but uh, there are similar analytic places out there, like a, like a PFF uh, that keep track of, of advanced statistics, you know, and they're out there ranking these players already. And so you can look at a, a list of, 200 300 players take a look at, at at you know guys that you think might pop you know stuff a lot of stuff happens behind the scenes where there's handlers or whatever you want to call them i feel like that's there's kind of a gross uh connotation with the word handlers but representatives of players right a, a parent a, a former coach something of that nature that they're like look you know little johnny's not very happy uh in the middle of february for x team and as soon as that portal opens, look for his name to be out there. So I think that's typically how those types of things go. And I'm sure there's somebody, whether it be, you know, I don't know what's legal with, again, I don't know what's legal with the NIL conglomerates, uh, but I'm sure there's stuff that's going on behind the scenes. So are there any players out there that you're looking at that, that you've seen have entered the portal that, that, you know, are somebody to keep an eye on that are interesting to you? You know, I know we said we saw the one player um, that entered the portal and, and included Louisville on a long list of players. Uh, anybody else stand out right now? Uh, there's not. It's it's just so hard right now because you don't know who the coach is, so you don't really know what they're looking for, and you don't know who the coach is going to retain. So there are obviously a lot of talented players in the portal right now, like Michael Ajayi from Pepperdine. He's really, really talented swingman. Um but to me, I just think it's it's too early. We can talk about some names. Kanye Clary from Penn State's a really good player who hit the portal. He's going to be top 10 uh, name, probably regardless of how many names hit the portal. But I think it's just going to depend. Does Sky Clark come back? Does Brandon Hunley Hatfield come back? Does Caleb Glenn withdraw his name from the transfer portal? Does Dusty May bring in John O'Davis, whoever this next coach is? Who do they bring in? So I think it's it's tough, and I'm not really concerned with the names right now just because I know there's going to be talent out there. And once we get a coach in and we understand what a sy system is and understand, okay, he's got three players returning for Louisville and he's got four guys coming with him from FAU. I think that's when it'll be easier to be like, okay, we clearly need a three. Mike James, right. Trey White are gone. We got to have a three. We need to go get Michael Ajayi or whoever it is. So I think it's early right now. There are some really talented names out there like Kanye Clary, Michael Ajayi, Brandon Garrison, Doug McDaniel, guys like that. But I think it's just, it's a little early on to, to talk about it. And I'm not, I'm not too concerned. I know that whatever coach we land, he will get whoever he needs. Yep. I mean, look, Jacob said it the best last week, you know, if you're looking for players to recruit for next year's team, you got to look for a little, and there's not a lot of winners that are available right now. Right. You know, all of the guys that you're potentially going to want that are going to pop and end up in the portal uh, are, are probably going to be playing this weekend. You know, they might be playing next weekend. You know, these are guys that that are on successful teams already, that they've been a part of winning culture, and they're just looking for something that's a little bit better of a fit. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you, J Jake, that, you know, it's nice to see some of these players entering the portal, but if they're coming from a 7 and 25 team or whatever they are, you know, maybe the, the next coaching staff is going to be looking elsewhere. Um, we saw, you know, I saw Dusty May picked up, a guy from UConn last year. So, you know, there, there's, there's interesting ways of going about it. You know, a guy maybe from UConn or, or a similar program that they're just not getting the playing time that they had hoped for, or it's just not a good fit for them. They could find success elsewhere. Like he found with, with Vlad golden, uh, I think three years ago now um, from, from Texas tech. So um, enough about dusty may, because I do think that there's this, this kind of, quiet rumbling a little bit about okay what if it's not dusty may like what if that's not the guy so it's not you know we've been talking a lot scott drew dusty may those have been the names over and over again 
A lot of people are talking Will Wade. Uh, we've kind of dove into the fact that it just doesn't make sense with Will Wade. Will Wade in five years makes sense. You know, we know that he has the coaching acumen. We know that he could, you know, turn around a program or get a program going in the right direction very fast. I mean, he's at freaking McNeese State just killing it right now. But the fact is, there's a <laughs> there's a whole lot that that of 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 concern with 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 being on probation still until November 2nd of this year and taking a guy like like a Will Wade, uh, a guy that has a show cause a guy that it just does it doesn't make sense for Louisville to take him right now. There's been some chatter there. I just I'm not really willing to to have that conversation because I just don't think based on everything Josh heard has said, Will Wade feels like the last guy that they'd be going after right now. Yeah, I think um I understand the fans and there are some people. I think I saw someone made a uh like go sign this or whatever, like right, like thing, a, like well, GoFundMe, like petition or whatever. Yeah, yeah sign this like petition that. thing for Louisville to hire Will Wade. I mean, if you listen to Josh Hurt's comments in the press conference, whenever we let go of Kenny Payne, he was very clear that he has a higher threshold for character than what he would consider most people have. So to me, right there, that eliminates Will Wade. That eliminates Chris Beard. That could eliminate Nate Oates. Um, and maybe that's the reason why we didn't go after him. He's got an extension now. So it's going to eliminate guys like that. So to me, I understand why people want that name because he has been successful, though not really, I think, as successful as people real think. He's only ever gone to one Sweet 16. He's never gone past it. He had LSU. He had one really good year with LSU where they won the regular season SEC. But besides that, they were like fourth or fifth in what at that time wasn't an amazing SEC like it is now. So to me, I don't I don't really get it. And I don't really think there's any point to talk a ton about Will Wade because he he's off the table. So if I look at the other names, we've still got a 5% chance of Scott Drew going down my coaching search list. Chris Beard's no. That's been made clear. Nate Oates is no. He just signed an extension. Eric Musselman sounds yeah. like there's I haven't I, it's still so weird to me we haven't heard anything on him I know Rutherford talked on his radio show a couple days ago about the first time that Louisville was hiring so two years ago when they ended up with Kenny Payne the search firm looked at Eric Musselman and came back and saw that there was something there that they did not like they did not recommend Eric Musselman as the next hire I think Rutherford said something about he likes to drink a lot which works really well in Louisville um, so so maybe that's why Josh Hurd didn't consider him two years ago and still isn't considering him now. I think he'd be a great hire, but I understand that if Josh Hurd's really high on character and having a guy that he thinks will represent the university well, he doesn't want Musselman. And Musselman's also going to be 60 in November. And Hurd came out and made the comments that he's not going to hire a 60-year-old. So I can see why that marks him out. TJ Otzelberger was next. $17 million buyout, I think is what it is at Iowa State. It's high. Yeah. I that's that's not happening. No school has ever paid more than like 4.5 million for a coach. So we're definitely not paying 17 million. Next on the list is Jerome Tang. We just spoke about him. It seems like he's out. Either his interview's not going well, or Josh Hur just looks at him and says, You've had one successful year and you've had one really bad year. And we've already seen what an unproven coach does at Louisville. And that's not good results. So maybe he's leaning away from that. That leaves Mick Cronin, which we talked about as well. Super high buyout. And that's another thing people are talking about. Oh, there's a loophole in his contract. There is no way that UCLA is going to be like, oh, yeah, there's a loophole. Let's not fight to get $16 million from Louisville. Like, there's yeah. going to be so yeah. much litigation behind that if we were to attempt to do that. That to me makes no sense logically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine a world where, you know, there's litigation, there's, <laughs> you know, uh, a, a bunch of, you know, trials going on back and forth for Louisville over freaking Mick Cronin. Like, again, if this is a guy that's like, you know, been super successful everywhere he's been, he's been, you know, I think when he was hired at UCLA, I don't think UCLA fans were super giddy about that hire. He was like their fifth option. Yeah. And he took over a team that was already loaded and they went to a final four. And since then, yeah, they've been they've been solid, but that's what he's been known for his entire career. He's never been known for putting a product out there where they're going to win 30 games in a season or, you know, go on these insane runs in the NCAA tournament. 
Uh, I mean, the reality is that more often than not, Mick Cronin's teams are like a seven to 10 seed uh, that end up flaming out in the first or second round. And it's like, you know, is, is that the guy that you want? Uh, the, the other name that has been servicing just a little bit is Bruce Pearl, which I know we kind of got into that two years ago. And it was pretty apparent that, that Bruce Pearl got a contract extension because of the conversation with Louisville. But is that, you know, where you go knocking on his door one more time, see what happens there now that, you know, there it's very clear uh, that there's no more punishments coming down, that there's black cloud or any of that. Much easier to hire a guy like that going forward. But then you look at Bruce Pearl, he's 64 years old. That's a guy who he might be looking to retire at Auburn. I mean, it, it's it's kind of the same conversation um, as our guy at Houston. Uh, why can I think, not think of his name? Kelvin Sampson. Kelvin Sampson, thank you. You're, I have this, like, disease where I can't remember names sometimes. So, um, no, I mean, it's the same thing with, like, a Kelvin Sampson. Like, that's a guy that could be retiring, you know, any minute now. You know, he's that's a guy that if he goes on to – if they win it all this year, which they have a very good chance of doing so, he might just ride, at, ride out that wave and just, you know, go out a champion. You know, after after everything that he's been through with the NCAA, so you know there are great coaches out there, but there are very few that that are going to be a, a quality fit. One that I'd throw out there: What do you think about Pat Kelsey? Oh, Charleston. Yeah, College of Charleston. Yeah, I think he's good, and I think that's a name that that could get hot in March. Who do they play in the first round? They're a 13 seed. Do they play Alabama? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's a guy that I think right now would still be considered probably a D tier hire underneath. Mick Cronin underneath, probably Jerome Tang, Dusty May, guys like that, maybe a C tier higher. But I mean, if you see him go and win against Charleston and then second round win against St. Mary's, even an Elite Eight run beating North Carolina, something like that, I think that is something that could be possible. I, I still, I don't, I don't think we'll end up with a name that low. I still think there are other names out there like Ashaka Smart, Porter Moser, Lamont Paris. Well, Lamont Paris just got an extension. I believe. And then so did Amir yes. Abdur Rahim. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, but I still think there are probably guys out there that are a better name than that. I mean, I still love my man, Josh shirts. I think, yeah, I think Indiana state getting, I'm going to say fucked and not getting put in the tournament. And instead Virginia getting put in the tournament really kills any chance that he has for a Josh Hurd to build up enough confidence in the fan base to make that higher. Right. But I think I, I'd rather have him. And Shaka Smart to me kind of seems like a logical candidate to go here, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anything on it. And maybe that's just because he's happy at Marquette. They've been back to back two seeds. He's in one of the best basketball conferences, making a ton of money. So, I mean, to me, I understand why he's not interested, but that's another name that I'm kind of surprised, at least hasn't been thrown out there a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if his buyout or something like that's just ridiculous. Yeah, and it's um, a private and, school, so who knows? Yeah, and he he's a guy, I believe he's from that area. Like, it just makes sense for him to just kind of ride it out there. He's tried the thing where he went from a went from BCU to Texas, and that just did not pan out. Uh, and now he's found lightning in a bottle once again at Marquette. It's like, I mean, dude, just don't, <laughs> you know, I, I would not blame him at all, at, at all for just, having Marquette be his final landing spot. That's a quality program where uh, like Louisville, you know, they're very basketball focused there. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would like a Bruce Pearl type of hire. Uh, that would, again, that would fly in the face of what Josh Hurd has said before, but I think he'd be extremely successful. I think you need that type of personality ultimately at Louisville. But there's not a lot of those out there. Uh, you mentioned Josh Shirts. I think that's a guy, he's like a Jeff Wald's, Jeff Wald's type of personality, like very personable, not afraid to speak his mind, not afraid to say ex exactly what he's thinking. Um, and he, he has this, this way about him that he's just able to kind of captivate an audience when he's speaking, he's able to get his players to, to do exactly what, what he needs. Uh, and he's able to take, you know, a, a minimal amount of talent and really maximize their capabilities. Uh, I really like a guy like Josh Hurts. You know who um, had the number one offensive rating in, in all of college basketball this year? It would, it would have to be Indiana State. I mean, I believe it was Indiana yeah. State. Yeah, I mean, they, even we're, we're hyping up Dusty May's offense, which is very incredible. Top 15, mm -hmm. top 17. But I mean, number one offense at Indiana State, that's insane. 
Like that yeah, is I mean, truly insane. If you, if you think about the reason why Indiana State's not in the tournament, it's literally because Drake just got insanely hot and, and hit almost like every shot that they took against Indiana State. Uh, overall, I mean, they, they were a quality team all year. It makes zero sense. I think they're like one of the highest rated Kim Palm teams to never make the tournament. It just, yeah, I think they were like 26th in the net, which yeah. I think was the highest or 24th, something like that. It, mm-hmm. I think they just want, they'd rather have a bigger name school that's going to bring more eyeballs to a yeah, UVA but, getting in as opposed to get everybody State. to sleep at 9 30 on a Tuesday night in the play in game. I mean, can I, yeah, I, I don't want to admit this, but. The playing, I watched the Howard game, had some money on that, lost that, ate with my girlfriend, and then she was like, can we watch The Bachelor? Because we have it recorded. And I was yeah. like, in the back of my mind, I was like, but, but, but Virginia plays at 8 right. o'clock. And I was like, okay, we'll watch The Bachelor. We get done with The Bachelor. I check halftime. They've scored 14 points. I've yeah. never been so happy in my life to watch a Women Tell All Bachelor episode than to have to sit through that and watch Virginia score. Yeah, zero we, points for the last nine and a half minutes of the, of the first half. We we had the similar situation. We threw on the Nickelodeon, Amanda Bynes, Josh Pet or uh, mm-hmm. Drake Bell, whatever his name is, mm-hmm. um, tell all type of thing. I checked the score at halftime and they have fourteen points. I was like, number one, all my parlays are fucked, and number two, it's I mean just the least shocking thing ever to see Virginia mm-hmm. just lay another egg in the tournament. So, um. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we want to do just like the quickest bracket fill out ever. Um, on the other side, uh, starting 502 podcast, see you in just a second. Mr. and Mrs. is for everyone. From a more traditional 90 proof to a cash drink that's smoother. In 2013, Russ going to the hole. And boy, could we use that right now. Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon covers tastes, all different tastes of preferences, six different bourbons that they're offering. Be among the first to try Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, the official bourbon of State of Louisville and the Starting 502 podcast on shelves anywhere you find your liquor. And now online at Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon.com. All right, we are back and we are here to address this 2024 State of Louisville bracket challenge brought to you by our friends at Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon. They're going to throw in a bourbon tasting. We don't have all the details worked out, so I'm not going to give you, you know, a full. There will be a bourbon tasting for two, trying out some Mr. and Mrs. Bourbons. Um, We're also brought to you by our fine friends over at Frankfurt Avenue Liquors. They're going to throw in a gift card uh, to the winner. Uh, And then finally, uh, a gift basket, uh, some sort of prize package from T-Shirt Hooligan. We can do some State of Louisville swag. We can kind of decide whoever the winner is, what we ultimately decide to throw in. So here on my screen, I have the 2024 NCAA tournament bracket. Uh, And Jake and I are going to very quickly fill out, you know, a a bracket together. If we can't decide, I said we should do a coin flip. I don't even really have, I don't have a coin. I don't think Um, maybe we can like rock, paper, scissors for it or something. Um, Whoever wins rock, paper, scissors gets it. Let's let's fly through this thing real fast. So we got the East region open. UConn. Are we in agreement? UConn. I told think? you I was going to argue with you for 20 minutes why Stetson will <laughs> defeat UConn. No, absolutely. UConn moves on. Any opinions on the Hatters? <laughs> Not a single thought. Cool name. Um, so we have uh, FAU and Northwestern. Again, FAU uh, playing on Friday night at 12 or Friday afternoon at 1215. Um, any concerns about FAU over Northwestern? I admittedly don't know as much about Northwestern as I thought I would. I do know that they are terrible at defending the three and FAU is one of the best teams in the country at shooting the three. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my initial logic behind it. Also FAU, obviously the run last season, uh, they have pretty much everybody back from that team. Any thoughts, any arguments for Northwestern? I think the only argument there is that they do have Boo Booey, who is the, probably going to be the best player on the court at all times. Um, But I think I'm going to trust what could be Louisville's next head coach and Dusty May. They, they proved it last year that they can make a deep run and they've still got all those same guys that made the deep run last year. So I I, I'm, I'm safe there with you. Let's go FAU. Where are our upsets going to come from? So uh, the first opportunity here, as people know, it's really 50, 50 on these, these five, 12 games. It seems like the 12 wins just as much as the five does. I think there's some kind of streak going on right now. It's like something crazy, like 20 straight years that a 12 is won a 12-5 game. 
it didn't happen last year. It was like the first time that it hadn't okay. happened in okay. like 20 years, like you said. Okay, so any thoughts on UAB? I mean, San Diego State, again, a Final Four team from last year. We have three of them in this, in this region. I know. Um, they they kind of screwed UConn. Y'all, yeah, whatever. UConn's got a, in my opinion, I think they got a cakewalk. Um, but what a, what do we got here? San Diego State. This is probably the game I know the least about. Like, I, I, I truly, I don't think I've watched a San Diego State game all season. Uh, but here they are back again as a five seed. It's tough to stay up that late. Mountain West was really disappointing last year in the tournament besides San Diego State. Um, they got, what, six teams in this year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's it's definitely a competitive league. Um, UAB's not bad. They beat USF. I think they have a chance they could win this one. I'm with you. I have not watched a lot of San Diego State. They are on way too late, and I'm in bed by like 9.30 every night. Right. So I'm really fine going either way here. I could see the upset from UAB, but I'd also be fine going chalk and just going with San Diego State with that Final Four experience from last year. You know, UAB is in a similar boat to me as like an NC State where they kind of caught lightning in a bottle. They expended all their energy to, to win uh, their conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, reality is FAU should have – or South Florida should have won that conference and probably been bumped up a little bit. UAB ultimately, you know, <laughs> comes out victorious in a very weird conference tournament. I think San Diego State's the pick just because, again, you're going with their experience. UAB, you know, I I'm big on that, like, they've expended too much emotion. You know, they've been through the ringer already. We're not expect expected to win their conference tournament. Already overachieving. Uh, they're going to be like a darling pick, but I think it's San Diego State, man. Um, yep, I agree with you. Cool with that. We get into a fun one here. Auburn and Yale. Four thirteens are always fun. Um, I believe, uh, again, it, it's one of those stats where thirteens are, are beating fours way more often than than people like to be comfortable with. Uh, this is Friday afternoon at four fifteen, uh, and I think this is going to be appointment television here. Auburn is has been great as far as the the analytics love Auburn. They think they're a, a top five ten team have thought that all year. We talked about Bruce Pearl, how successful he's been. Um, what any, any takes on Yale? I don't have any hot takes on Yale other than a lot of people are, are, are picking this upset. So I watched him play. They played Brown in the Ivy League Championship on Sunday, I believe. They should have lost that game. Brown was up, I want to say, like 10, 12 points at one point. Yale did that's the first time I watched Yale not a big Ivy League hoops guy um, Yale did not impress me at all and Auburn has impressed me thoroughly multiple times throughout the year I think the only thing Yale really slows it down they're a really really slow paced team and they're pretty good right. offensive rebound they've got a couple good three-point shooters so right. they've got some of the pieces you need to make that upset but Auburn's rolling they just won the SEC to me I think that Auburn's a safe pick there and we are as chalky as can be yeah, I mean, chalk in the first four picks, but does that change with BYU and Duquesne? Duquesne sneaking in there with an 11 seed. How about that? I know. Yeah, Duquesne beat VCU. They looked pretty good. VCU really tried to make a run there at the end, I think on Sunday as well. Uh, so they're another team that won the conference championship. So does that mean, are they hot? Or does that mean they've expended all their energy in five days to win it? I don't have any strong feelings. I know BYU is much better at home than they are on the road and neutral yes. site. So... If you want to go Duquesne there, I'm cool with going Duquesne. Let's roll Duquesne. I mean, I, I have a couple brackets. You know, I, I have one for work. We're doing this the State of Louisville bracket challenge. Um, I've picked BYU to hit the Sweet 16, it feels like, every time. Uh, and we'll get in, into that in a second. Um, I'm fine with Duquesne, though. I, I could absolutely see that happening, especially because BYU is so good at home. They've been so bad away from away from home. Let's go Duquesne. Let's Duquesne. mix it up a little bit. Um. Now, a fun one of local interest as well, Moorhead State. Uh, Moorhead State has been a quality uh, team all season. Uh, again, another team that the analytics like. Um, they're going to shoot the shit out of the ball. Um, any takes on Moorhead State over Illinois? I mean, Illinois, again, they've you know kind of snuck under the radar as like a top 15 type of team all season. They get in as a three seed. Uh, and any takes on Moorhead State over Illinois, or do you think that Illinois is good enough to, to you know, take them down? Preston Spradlin has Moorhead State rolling 26-8 and eight this year, I think. Really, really, really good team. But 
to me, I just think Illinois has too many electric players. They are really one dimensional. They're very heavy offense, very light on the defense. But when you've got guys like Terrence Shannon that can just take over a game, get to the free throw line 14 times a game, to me, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see Illinois losing at least this early. Right, right. I, I think that this would be where Morehead State would just have to go off. But I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at the, the teams that they played in the tournament, you know, have them if you're watching on YouTube. I have them pulled up here, you know, 40-point loss to Alabama, 30-point loss to Purdue, uh, 20, 20, what, 23-point loss to Penn State. You know, they beat Bellarmine by about the same margin that Louisville beat them by. Um, you know, a close game with Indiana, but again, not a, a great Indiana team this year. So nothing to to really write home about other than, again, they like playing that up-tempo style. Um, but, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Illinois is the pick here. Um Let's see. Let's let's go forward a little bit. Maybe try to pick up the pace just a little bit. Washington All right, State Drake. Drake. It's Drake. It's Drake. It's Drake. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tucker DeVries is amazing. Tucker DeVries is the best team in that conference in NBC. He had a really bad tournament last year, and they're really well coached and are just as good as Indiana State, and I thought Indiana State would make the Sweet 16, so Drake. There you go. Uh, Iowa State over South Dakota State. Uh, any love for the Jackrabbits? I mean, I love Iowa State. I think this is a great squad. It was like South Dakota State's in the tournament every single year, and they lose in the round of 64 every single year. Uh, so I love Iowa State. They have looked no better than they did in their conference championship against Houston. So they're rolling. I go Iowa State. Let's go, baby. And let's go ahead and finish out this bracket here. So we have UConn and FAU. I mean, I, I still think UConn's the number one team in the country for a reason. Mm-hmm. Number one overall seed. I, I would I would not be shocked. Like, I wouldn't be floored if FAU beat them. I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if this if this was a competitive game, but I'd be uh, more surprised if it was a competitive game than it was a blo- you know than if it was a blowout. Uh, I, I think that I think at UConn takes this one. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think the FAT FAU team last year did so well because they were elite offensively and very good defensively. This year they are average at best on defense, and I think that's going to kill them. UConn's got too many players. I move UConn on. San Diego State and Auburn. Um, you know, again, I really like this Auburn squad. We talked about, we haven't seen a lot of San Diego state this year. Um, you know, I'll leave this one up to you, Jake. I think it's Auburn. Like they're like we said earlier, two minutes ago, Auburn is rolling. I mean, I, I, I think it's Auburn. I think that's going to be an incredible game. UConn versus Auburn in the elite eight. We have, uh, Sweet 16. we've been relatively chalky so far. The only two upsets we have are Duquesne over BYU and Drake over Washington State, which I think that's probably going to be close to a pick them anyways. Um, Duquesne and Illinois, kind of the same thought process here with Illinois. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard for these these teams to bring upsets and then get back down to reality and keep it moving. Uh, I think if Duke, Duquesne does win this game, I, I think Illinois blows them out personally. Yeah, I think the I think it's Illinois. I, I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. I will say though. Drake, Iowa State is interesting to me. I've made about four or five brackets now, and in a couple of them, I have taken Drake. They're okay. a really good team. They've got a star player that can carry them through the tournament, like a Jimmy Fredette, yeah, like a Steph Curry, like something like that. They have the talent, and I saw a stat somewhere, and Mike Rutherford's talked about it a lot. Teams that are low-ranked in the preseason, unranked in the preseason, and then overachieve greatly throughout the year are like prime candidates for bowing out in the round of 64 or the round of 32. So if you want to go a little freaky there, we can go Drake. Let's, let's, let's get in our feelings here and go Drake. Okay. How about that? Dude, if Drake goes to the sweet 16, like you're not going to be able to stop me with, with the, with the Drake references, it's mm-hmm. going to be all over the place. Um, so we do have a final four in this region of Yukon and Auburn, Illinois and Drake. Uh, are you thinking Yukon or do you think is, is Auburn? Is this where they kind of trip up? I think it's UConn. I mean, I know it's it's so chalky. The number one overall seed they won last year. I may have a fifty dollars future on UConn to win the national championship, but I just think go. they're they're so perfectly balanced. They brought back so much talent from last year. They added even more talent in. So to me, UConn's got the experience, and they've got a psycho coach in Danny Hurley that will not let them play a B minus game or a C plus game. I love watching UConn, and when they get knocked out, I'll be sad because I want to watch quality basketball this March. Mm-hmm. And I think that UConn is, you know, when, when you talk about the best teams in the last 10, 20 years, they're up there, man. Uh, and, and they have a chance to, you know, submit this you, or su- cement themselves is, is kind of a, 
a dynasty type of type of team. Uh, I like UConn, uh, Illinois, Drake, any upset potential here? Does Drake keep the ball rolling or are we looking at Illinois here? I, I'm going to let you go here. I've made a lot of picks. I could, I'm kind of in love with Drake. So I understand I, I, I pushed him to the sweet 16. You, you have to make the decision here. All right. Well, we'll go Illinois. You know, it's very common. A lot of people, you know, it's, it's very rare that a, a, a 10 plus seed makes the elite eight or final four. March Madness is known for these upsets, but the reality is once you get to that second weekend, it's typically, you know, your five seeds, your one seed, your two seeds, you know, like they, you still weed out some of the quote unquote lesser teams. I think in, in this instance, I could absolutely see, you know, again, an Illinois team that not a lot of people are talking about. They end up in the elite eight with UConn. So we'll go with that. Uh, and then that leaves us with UConn and Illinois. Um, any, any thoughts here, any upset potential from Illinois or, are we just rolling straight to the final four with UConn? I, I mean, my vote is for UConn. I think Illinois' biggest issue is they don't play defense very well. They've given up like 97 points to, I think it was like Minnesota. I watched one of the games in mm-hmm. Minnesota's ass at basketball. I just don't think they have the defense that will consistently win them, what, six six straight games, five straight games, whatever it's necessary to win the championship. I'm in agreement with you. I, Illinois has been trying to get over this hump for a while where they have great regular seasons, can't quite get it done in the tournament. I think Elite Eight is great for them, but I think this UConn team, again, I think they're on they're on a roll. Um, moving down to the West region, North Carolina and Wagner. Uh, Wagner, first ever NCAA tournament win last night. Um, we go in North Carolina. We're going North Carolina. I have my doubts about North Carolina, but I don't doubt that they can beat Wagner. Me neither. I, I, I liked, I think this is a UConn team that peaked a little bit too early. They were a really quality squad when they played Kentucky back in December. I just don't think that they have the dogs to, you know, make it to a final four. We'll get into that into that in a second, but I think they roll against Wagner. Now we get into Mississippi state against Michigan, Mississippi state, a a, kind of a a, a darling here. A lot of people are picking Mississippi state to make it to the sweet 16, knock out the first number one seed, but they face Michigan state and, you know, (laughs) Michigan state very quietly had a solid run last year. uh, And they, this is what Tom Izzo teams do, right? They just sneak into the tournament, and then that's just a team you just do not want to face. Um, are they able to get over the hump against Mississippi State, or um, are we going with the SEC school here? I think – I mean, they have Josh Hubbard, Mississippi State does, who's really, really good, really, really high-volume score. But to me, I'm going to trust Tom Izzo okay. in March. So, to me, January, February, March, Izzo. Like, it's 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 his tournament, and I could see him making to the Sweet 16 easy, like you said. Uh, and, you know, I like that pick. Mississippi State's been just a hot name lately, and that just sets it up perfectly for Tom Izzo to do his thing once again, uh, and, and and make it to you know make another run in the tournament. And man, they would be a tough matchup for North Carolina once again. Uh, kind of a green Hubert Davis still against you know the king of March, Tom Izzo. Uh, mm-hmm. And now we get into probably what I would consider the most exciting little um, region of the bracket. Uh, and that's the St. Mary's Grand Canyon and Alabama Charleston uh, games. I've gone back and forth, you know, the, every year there, there's this little portion of the bracket where you're like, okay, if, if we're able to, um, you know, if, if you're able to select say a Grand Canyon, all of a sudden, like, you know, if you miss out on a team like a Grand Canyon or a college of Charleston, then all of a sudden <laughs> you look up and your whole bracket is fucked because you totally missed out on this upset pick and they're making a deep run. I really like Grand Canyon, but St. Mary's has kind of, you know, dethroned Gonzaga there at least for a year in the West coast conference. Uh, Do we like St. Mary's to ultimately take down Grand Canyon or do you like what, what the other Drew brothers doing over there um, at GCU? Yeah. I like Bryce Drew. I like what he's done with the Lopes, but to me, St. Mary's watched them play against Gonzaga in the in the WCC championship. They're a really, really good team. Like, really good team. Aiden Mahaney is a 20-point-per-game scorer, easily sophomore guard. They've got four other guys that score in double digits, and they have a top-20 defense. I think, to me, that has Sweet 16, possibly even Elite 8, written all over it with a team like that. Grand Canyon, great story. Could certainly see them winning, but my money's on St. Mary's. We're going St. Mary's, and then we get into Alabama and Charleston. Again, This is a game where it could be 100 to 110, and I would not have any doubts. Two run-and-gun style teams. 
that's been kind of the style of play in the SEC, right? Not a lot of defense, but hey, they're kind of going the same direction. The SEC has gone in football, right? Like mm-hmm. where you, 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 you kind of staked your reputation on defense for so many years. All of a sudden the tides are starting to turn. No pun intended with Alabama here. Um, I like this tra- college of Charleston team. I already talked about, I think Pat Kelsey is going to be this kind of hot name, um, whether it be with Louisville or, or elsewhere, uh, you know, he could be a, a name that, that starts popping up for like a Michigan. Uh, he could be a name that starts popping up for some of these big name uh, jobs. But the one thing that Pat Kelsey lacks is a bunch of wins in the NCAA tournament. He's had a quality squad at College of Charleston for a while now, but he's trying to take this next step. Alabama kind of faltered down the stretch a little bit. Uh, do we like College of Charleston in an upset pick here? Or are we going chalk with Alabama? Do you think they have the dogs? So it's hard. I like Charleston a lot. I like Pat Kelsey a lot. They've won 12 straight games. It makes a lot of sense to pick College of Charleston. My issue is that they both play really similar styles, offense, 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 no defense. Right. Right. And to me, yeah, Alabama I, has the better athletes and the better players. And if you're going to try and beat Alabama at Alabama's game, Alabama is most likely going to beat you. So to me, can see the upset like I can with a lot of games, but I think it's Alabama. Richard Patino in New Mexico take on Clemson, a Clemson team that I just am so ind- indifferent about. Like, I like the story of Richard Patino finally getting New Mexico over the hump. I think it's their first tournament appearance in about 10 years. Uh, Clemson, you know, they have a lot of those upset wins this year, but a lot of just, I mean, <laughs> they played, you know, neck and neck with Louisville this season. You know, they they seem to get up for the big games, but, you know, they've not been able to get over the hump in the NCAA tournament last year. You know, that loss to Louisville ultimately kept them out of the NCAA tournament. Uh, what what are we thinking here? Do we like the the, the Patino Juniors or uh, are we going Clemson? Give me Patino Jr. They played really, really well in a difficult conference all year long. They sh- they should have made it in as an at-large, even if they didn't win the conference tournament, but they went ahead and did it anyway. To me, Clemson is the most mid-team ever. Oh, I, there's man. nothing. They, I mean, they got P.J. Hall. P.J. Hall's great. Joseph Girard, yeah. uh, a quality player. And that's But, I mean, like, it's he, hard for me to watch them play so competitively with Louisville and then be like, oh, yeah, that's a team that's going to win games in March. So, right, to me, right. I'm fine with taking the fight in Richard Patino's. I like I I just really like New Mexico as like that dark horse Sweet Sixteen pick. Um, you know they they've gotten hot at the right time. Like I I think you know this this will be like I said probably my third or fourth bracket I've done. Um, and I think I pick New Mexico every time just because I don't trust Clemson. Um, I haven't for a while now. Um, I just I I think I I like that New Mexico pick. Um, so. Let's go, let's go ahead to Baylor and Colgate. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Scott Drew, not a lot about this Colgate team quite yet. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on Colgate. Uh, it's like my third favorite toothpaste brand. Um, <laughs> besides that, I know that they've gone, they're another team like South, like uh, South Dakota State. They're, it seems like they're in the tournament every year and they lose in the first round every year. I don't, I want Colgate to win. I want Scott Drew to feel a little bit of pressure, like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't the place that I can win a national championship at. But to me, I don't think it's going to happen. Baylor's still a really solid team. The defense isn't there as much as it has been in years past, but I think it's good enough to win at least one game. Okay, very good. I, I'm I'm with you on Baylor. Um, again, you know, Scott Drew, the reason we like him so much is he just puts together these solid squads. They're always solid defensively. Um you know, they've had some clunkers against like the Houston's of the world, uh, Iowa State's of the world. Um, but no, I, I, I like Baylor. I'm uh, moving down Dayton and Nevada. This has been it's, it's, this is another one of those where, you know, if, if you don't pick the right team between Dayton and Nevada, you know, I think both of those teams are capable of beating Arizona. Uh, what say you on Dayton, Nevada? I like Nevada. They've got Steve Alford as their coach. They've got a coach that has a lot of experience and has a lot of tournament experience previously being at UCLA. So my pick is Nevada. I don't know nearly enough enough about Dayton to give an answer for them. So Nevada. Very good. Um, so we'll go Nevada here and then Arizona Long Beach State. Now, the one thing that we haven't gotten into, a two seed has lost the last three seasons. No. Uh, is this Is this where it happens? Um, Arizona was upset early, totally screwed over everybody's bracket last year. 
Um, is Arizona able, able to get it done? Long Beach State fired their coach like a week ago, and yep. he's still coaching for them, which is the strangest fucking thing in the world. It's odd. Awesome. Um, Dan Monson is a solid coach. I don't. I think Arizona's pretty good. Um, I don't see them losing this game, especially with a coach that's already basically resigned to leaving after this year. So I'm I'm going to stick with Arizona. Yep, I'm I'm going Arizona too. I just. <laughs> I can't imagine the storylines if you have a team like Long Beach State. Like, what do they do with their coach now? I mean, uh, you know, I, I haven't heard what's going on behind the scenes there. Let's go back up to the top here, North Carolina, Michigan State. A lot of good matchups here. Um, North Carolina, Michigan State will start it off. Uh, is North Carolina able to make it to the Sweet 16, or is the King of March, uh, you know, retaking his crown once again? I think, and I'll let you make the final call here. But I I think I think Izzo does it. I I think, like you said, North Carolina was hot early on, and they've looked pretty average. I mean, they've got a lot of great pieces. They've got Armando Baycott. They've got R.J. Davis. They've got Harrison Ingram. They have Jalen Withers, not a great piece, but they uh, have yeah, you know, good they enough. have really good pieces to be a solid team. But watching this team, especially against North Carolina State, losing by ten basically the whole entire game. I feel like Izzo can do this. Michigan State was a top five team preseason. They have the talent and the coach to do it. So I think Michigan State. We're going Michigan State. At some point, we got to pick a one or two seed to not make the Sweet 16. Yeah, I yeah. think this might be where it happens here. Uh, St. Mary's in Alabama. Again, a great matchup. If it was Grand Canyon College or Charleston, I think that would also be a great matchup. If it was any of these four teams uh, playing each other in the round of 32, um, I think this is a great portion of the bracket. Probably the most exciting area to watch, which means that these teams are probably going to blow each other out. That's how it goes, right? Um, mm -hmm. So any thoughts on St. Mary's, Alabama? I personally, in this matchup, like Alabama because they have that run-and-gun style of play. Um, I think that they can make the tempo as such that, you know, they can make it really uncomfortable for, for St. Mary's and kind of blow, blow the doors off right away. What do you think? So this is going to be our first coin toss. We'll have to do it. Let's do it. I think that St. Mary's wins. I think that St. Mary's is the style of team that will give Alabama problems. Plays really good defense, has an elite guard that can score in the crunch time, and rebounds really, really well. So unlike in the Charleston game where I kind of wanted to pick them over Alabama, they just play two similar styles. St. Mary's plays a complete different style. So but yeah, let's let's go St. Mary's, man. I, I I like it. I like the the hecticness that can go on in this this side of the bracket. Let's go St. Mary's. You got me convinced. I, I'm, I'm all in on the Gales. Uh, I think I picked Grand Canyon in my other brackets, so I like it. I, I, I think that that's, there's a strong possibility of that happening. We move on to Richard Bettino versus Scott Drew, which would be one of the most watched games in this area, um, and that would be, I'm assuming, on Sunday, sometimes Sunday afternoon. Uh, what, what do we think? Can Richard Bettino get it done, or does Baylor, Baylor keep rolling? And I, I don't have strong feelings. Every part of me wants to pick New Mexico just because I want, like we said earlier, Scott Drew to get out of the tournament as early as possible. So I'll let you make the final decision on this one. Let's go. Let's go to New Mexico. Let's support our guy, Richard Bettino. Right. You know, a lot of a lot of people have been saying that they're they're high on, you know, Richard Bettino returning. I don't think that would ever happen. Um, but I, I do like them here. I, I just I think he has the basketball acumen to take down a team like Baylor. Uh, and at some point, you know, Baylor's been so consistent in March. You know, I, I really like, you know, the the idea of them getting upset at some point early on in this tournament. I think a, a New Mexico team could do that. Um, if Clemson were to win that game, by the way, I think that Baylor would destroy Clemson. Um, so, yeah, really, that that's one of those where if Clemson ends up pulling that one out, you know, you could see Baylor make it to an Elite Eight type of game. Uh, we moved down to Nevada and Arizona again. Um, any thoughts on Nevada pulling the upset here, or do we like Arizona uh, moving on? I think I like Arizona. I mean, I think they, they are one of the few teams that I think could win a national championship. So I, I think Arizona moves on. We're back to Michigan state and St. Mary's, a, a matchup that a lot of people probably don't have. Um, what do you think Michigan state and St. Mary's the St. Mary's your, your kind of Cinderella this season? I think they might be. I think they might be my darling. I mean, maybe I just fell in love with them beating the piss out of Gonzaga on Saturday or Sunday of last weekend. Always good to see those dudes lose. Yeah, but I mean, I like. I mean, I've said it before. 
They're well well balanced in scoring, which helps out. They play good defense, which you need in March. And they have Austin Mahoney, who is a certified bucket. So to me, I think they have the pieces necessary to make that Cinderella runs the elite eight, but let's do it. It's hard to fight against Izzo, but I think St. Mary's go Gales. It is, but I don't think this is again, I could be totally wrong, but I don't think this is a Michigan state squad. Like we talked about coming off the high of beating a UNC team. I just, I really like St. Mary's in that particular matchup. Uh, moving down to Arizona and New Mexico, again, we have our, our uh, other Cinderella in New Mexico. Uh, can they take down Arizona? I mean, that's kind of a, a great regional matchup as well. Um, or, or do you like Arizona advancing? I think I like Arizona. They're really heavy offensively, but I think talent just wins out at some point against New Mexico. So that puts us at, I'm, I'm in agreement, by the way, that puts us at St. Mary's and Arizona in the Elite Eight. Who's going to the final four? Um, are we are we pulling for the Gales? Um, or, or ultimately, is is Arizona just too much? That's tough, man. I kind of want to fuck. I kind of want to click St. Mary's. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's. I, mean, I, I do love Caleb Love though. You yeah. know, a guy who he got really hot a couple of years ago in UN, at UNC. Obviously, there was kind of a falling out there. They really had two guys playing a similar 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 role at UNC a season ago. Uh, now that Caleb loves kind of a primary um, factor there. I mean, I think that he's a guy that can put his team on the, uh, put the team on his back. Um, you know, what's your gut telling you? Gut's telling me St. Mary's I'm, I'm feeling right. a Cinderella run. Let's do it. So we do have UConn and St. Mary's in the final four. We'll move up uh, to the South region. We have Houston and Longwood. Um, are we liking Houston here? Or Sorry, did you keep... did you say my name? <laughs> I mean, we there, there's the whole Reddit thread about you know teams that are like a dick joke name uh, have beaten a one or two seed in the last couple of years, the last three years actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm, Houston is such a good team. Houston is a juggernaut. They, I have that. concerns with them maybe making it all the way to Final Four or National Championship, but I, I don't have concerns with them beating off the Longwood. <laughs> These uh these eight nine games and the five twelve games are always difficult, but uh, maybe even more so this year. Nebraska, hot name. Um, they have a point guard on their team who is you know an Asian sensation, if you will. Um, it's always great when to see like the Asian community get behind when players are doing you know really solid. Um, and and you know Nebraska again, they they had they have a quality squad who you know, through a, a pretty tough big 10 slate. Um, they had, they had a lot of quality wins. You know, if we go in and, t- and take a look at what, what their big games were, um, you know, lost to Creighton, lost to Wisconsin, but destroyed Purdue, destroyed Ohio state, um, beat, beat Wisconsin the second time around. Um, they have close losses to Illinois twice uh, and then a blowout loss to Northwestern. Uh, and they're facing a, a Texas A&M team. So if we go back up and look at Texas A&M's resume really quickly, uh, you they've, know, Texas they've A&M, won some impressive games. They have. So they have a close loss to Houston, which that would be an interesting matchup to, to happen there in the round of 32. Uh, they have a, a semi a quasi close loss to Auburn. Uh, but if you remember, they beat Kentucky in a really good game back in January, they beat Tennessee uh, very soundly back in February. They beat um, Iowa State. They beat Iowa State, which is not even not on there, but they, they did win. Notable results. Um, so a win and a loss, you know, split the split the games against Tennessee, beat Kentucky twice, uh, close loss to Florida. Um, you know, I'll, I'll leave this up to you, but I really do like this Texas, Texas A&M team. Yeah, I think with – I mean, they've got elite, They've got the most elite wins out of any nine seed in the tournament. So, yes, to me, I, I think it's I think it's A&M. Uh, so, now we move down to Wisconsin and James Madison. James Madison's a very popular pick um, as, as a Sweet 16 team. I actually have a futures bet on them uh, to make it to the Sweet 16. I think they were like plus 650 to make it to the Sweet 16. Wisconsin has been so up and down this year. I believe they lost like five or six straight games after moving up into, I believe, into the top ten earlier in the season uh, just completely faltered during the middle of the season, got their shit back together, went on the win, the big, big 10 tournament uh, beat Purdue. Um, You know, they really took it to Purdue, but they're facing a James Madison team that plays a really exciting style of ball. Um, 
and again, you know, James Madison in football and basketball have been really quality. Um, you know, they, they, they've really st- stepped it up since, since take, taking, taking it up a notch to a new conference. You know, they're out of the FCS in football. Uh, what, what do you think about James Madison over Wisconsin? I agree with you. They're 31 and three. I think that's the best record in the NCAA. They're on the longest win streak with 13 games. I mean, they're playing as well as anybody right now. They've already beat Michigan state once this year. So they've had, they have a big win there. It's they've proven they can beat quality teams. Wisconsin, like you said, early on looked amazing. Top 10, top 15 team. And then in like February, they just looked like one of the worst big 10 teams in right. the whole entire conference. And then they got hot in the big 10 tournament, almost beat Illinois. But I'm cool with James Madison. I think I think James Madison makes it to the Sweet 16, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of in agreement with you there, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, and, and what plays into that a lot is this Duke-Vermont matchup. Vermont, I believe it's their fifth straight appearance in the NCAA tournament. It seems like Vermont's just like a perennial, like, 12 to 15 seed in the tournament. Um, any thoughts about them upsetting Duke? I mean, I think this is a solid Duke squad, but again – Kind of like North Carolina, just like we're so mad down the stretch, you know. I I just don't I don't know enough about Vermont, honestly, to to say one way or another about picking them to upset Duke. It wouldn't shock me though. I am there with you. I really don't think this Duke team is very good. I really, really don't. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. I'd probably say they'll beat Vermont and then run into a lot more trouble with James Madison in that second round. I'm in agreement with you there. So we got we have Duke and James Madison going forward there. An interesting portion of the bracket of, um, you know, local relevancy, Uh, Kentucky and Oakland and Texas Tech and NC State. Obviously, NC State had that, uh, you know, massive run in in the NCAA tournament. My question is, do they have their legs under them? Are they emotionally ready for a matchup with a really quality Texas Tech squad? I... (sighs) It feels like it either goes one of two ways. That team that goes on a crazy run that shouldn't have made the tournament either makes it to the Sweet 16 Elite Eight or they disappoint, lose by 15 in the first round. Yep. I think Grant McCaslin has a really good team in Texas Tech. They played in a tough Big 12 all year long. They've been more consistent in NC State, though they do have DJ Horn and DJ Burns that are both really solid players. But I, I think I'd go Texas Tech here. I'm in agreement with you there. And I think that Texas Tech matches up much better with Kentucky. Great. Now, what you're looking at with Texas Tech and NC State for people who, you know, are, are looking at the local angle, um, neither of them are crazy good on the defensive end. And I don't think either of them match up well with Kentucky um, as kind of like a run and gun style. That's why I like Kentucky's draw so much, but they have to get past Oakland. Oakland has the most tenured turn, uh, coach in the tournament. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, what – what do we what do we think about Kentucky Oakland? Do you think that that's that's a blowout? I think it is. I mean, Kentucky's just got so much firepower. Oakland wasn't predicted to be very good this year. They have a really good coach, so they ended up making it thanks to a conference championship win or right. a conference tournament win in the championship. But I think I think it's Kentucky. I mean, they've got too much firepower. But again, Kentucky's had some ugly losses this year. But I I don't think it comes in the first round. We get to the injury portion of the bracket where we have Florida and Marquette down here at the bottom of this region. Uh, And Florida has to get through the winner of Boise state and Colorado, two quality squads that were both deserving uh, of, of making the, the, the tournament as the last four in Uh, what do you, what do you think about Boise state and Colorado? First of all, Uh, they'll play tonight. They'll play like right after we get off here. Um, What do we, what do we think about Boise State and Colorado, and are they capable of, of taking out Florida? I It's so hard for me to make this pick that I know always there's one team that starts in the first four and makes a run to the Sweet 16. Right, they get that momentum far. going. Yeah, yeah. It, it's always difficult for me, though, because I don't – is it going to be Boise? Is it going to be Colorado? I don't know. I do like this Florida team. They've had impressive wins, Kentucky, Alabama, and I think they beat Auburn as well. Right. They they are a pretty solid team. They had a guy get hurt. I don't know his name, but he wasn't like he wasn't like a starter. Like he wasn't like a huge player. Like it was a guy that you could it'd be like on this year's team if we lost Manny Okorafor or Caleb Glenn, like a tertiary piece that's gonna play minutes, but isn't like gonna kill you. So I think I like Florida here, but those first four teams can get hot and I'd be fine picking yeah. them too. They can, you know, if it's Boise State, I really like this Boise State team. They they have a quality squad. I think they're actually an underdog against Colorado, though. So 
Uh, you, we'll, we'll see. You know, we like that Colorado flavor so far, just destroying Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think Florida has enough firepower to advance. Um, they had that the, the player with a nasty injury uh, in the SEC championship and never really recovered from that. Uh, I don't know how, how much that's going to, to deter them, um, um, you know, going forward. But a lot of people like Florida is that sneaky pick, uh, especially with a matchup with a potential match, matchup with Marquette. What do we think about Marquette, Western Kentucky? Some more local flavor here. Dude, I'm, I'm five minutes away from WKU's campus right now. I've been to a couple games this year. Steve Lutz is a hell of a coach. He has yep. them playing fast. They turn the ball over a lot. But I think, I mean, that Conference USA tournament that they played in, they won every game by 20 points. I mean, granted, they got lucky with, like, Louisiana Tech losing and right. a couple other teams losing, so they didn't have to play the best teams. But they look really good. And Marquette looked just okay in that Big East tournament. They get Tyler Kolick back. Right. I think they've got more talent. I think we should pick Marquette to be smart, but yeah, I'm gonna put I, money on I'm gonna put money on WKU just just because the odds will be so good. I wouldn't be surprised with WKU really pushing this game. You know, with this being like a 75 to 73 type of final, I do think Marquette pulls it out, and I think the reason being Tyler Kolick. You know, it seems like they kept him out as as a precautionary thing um, in, in in the tournament, so. Uh, ultimately, I, I think that Marquette comes out victorious. Uh, going back up to the top of this region here, we have Houston and Texas A&M. Do we like Houston advancing here? I think I think we do. I think A&M's going to give them a hell of a game, though. I will say, I think Houston, I think Houston will still win, but they're they're going to give them a really good game. A&M has yeah. played well against top top quality competition. I'm in agreement. I'm excited if that's if that ends up being the matchup. I'm very excited about that. And then we talked a lot about James Madison Duke. Do we like the Dukes defeating the Duke? I think so. I think this Duke team's not very good. Yeah, I really, I, mean, I really don't think they're they're not four seed worthy. I mean, their record is, their resume is, but their talent wise, I don't think they are. I, I'm in full agreement with you there. Uh, we have Texas Tech and Kentucky. I really like Kentucky here, man. I hate to say it, but yep. they got as much as Kentucky fans complain about their draws. They have probably the best, first of all, for them to even secure a three seed over a four seed and then get into one of the more fortuitous draws, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I think Kentucky can pummel Texas A&M. Yeah, I think A&M doesn't Texas. play the right style to beat them. They need to more slow it down, dirty you up, muck up a game kind of team to make Kentucky struggle, and I don't think Texas Tech is that. Florida and Marquette, what do we think here? Two teams that are kind of, you know, Florida had their their center injured. Tyler Kolick, who's the star for Marquette, has been injured since the middle of February. Uh, do we think that Florida can pull this out, or is this uh, Shaka Smart, uh, you know, you know, capturing that lightning in a bottle um, th this March? I think it's I think it's Marquette. I think it's Tyler Kolick. That's that's a really good team. I could see Florida making it, but that's that's such a good dang team. That brings us back up to Houston and James Madison. Uh, James Madison plays a completely different style of ball than Houston does, but Houston, you know, like we talked about, they have that experience. They have an experienced head coach. They've been, been there, done that. They've done this before. Uh, this could be one of his final runs here in, in the Do you like Houston or do you like James Madden, Madison kind of just really creating a lot of chaos here? I think, I think the run ins for James Madison, an amazing run to the sweet 16, a really talented team, but when Houston's playing defense the way they always do and hitting 40% of their shots, they're one of the best teams in in college basketball. So then that brings us to Kentucky and Marquette. I think that, you know, a potential Kentucky Houston matchup could be awesome. Uh, I think that Kentucky matches up really well with Marquette. Um, what, what, what are we thinking here? It's a cold ass white guy versus cold ass white guy in Tyler yep. Kolick and Reed Shepard. I think Reed Shepard's better than Tyler Kolick. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think Kentucky matches up well against them now a team like houston they don't match up well with at all but a team right. like marquette they match up much better i think we're in we're this is really the first side of the bracket we're in like complete agreement with everything mm -hmm. uh, and that leaves us with houston kentucky um which in my opinion could absolutely be a final four or national championship matchup as well um we get into this elite eight, elite eight matchup do we like houston advancing I mean, they're the thing about Kentucky is they've just not had deep, you know, they've not been a defensively minded team all season. Whereas Houston is probably the best defensive team in the country. Um, you know, you know, strength against strength here. What do you, what do you like? 
in the NCAA tournament, defense wins out long term. Early on, upsets, crazy offensive spectacles can happen. 70% three point shooting, but to consistently win each round, you have to have defense. And Houston has all of it, and Kentucky has almost none of it. We're going with Houston there, but if if Kentucky pulls that one out, if if they end up in the Final Four, they're going to be ready to build Reed Shepard a statue. Oh, I mean, can further and Kentucky can be anybody i mean there's not a single sure, team sure. that if kentucky is on and playing even an ounce of defense they can beat every single team in the nation there's there have been points in the season where kentucky's been the best team in the country in my yeah. opinion um so we'll move down to the midwest region right now we have a final four of uconn st mary's and houston uh, the first game in the midwest region still not completely filled out here uh we're looking at montana state and grambling state uh, uh, uh the winner of that will face purdue purdue is has you know Obviously, they lost to the the other penis uh, team last year, the penis joke team in Oral Roberts. Uh, but I like Purdue here. Yeah, I, I think it's easy. Those smaller schools that already struggle with size, everyone struggles struggles with Zach Eady. I can't imagine how a team, granted St. Peter's beat him last year, so this probably isn't the best thought, but I don't know how a team like Grambling or Montana State handles him. I like a matchup between Utah State and TCU here. I, I like Utah State potentially as an upset pick over Purdue. However, they're facing your alma mater in TCU. You probably know a lot more about them than I do. Uh, what What are we thinking here, Utah State and TCU? I'll, I'll let you decide this one. Well, if you're going to let me decide this one, I'm going with TCU, of course. I mean, they play so up and down. They play really good defense. Their biggest issue is in the half court and making shots. That's been their issue all year. I think in that matchup against Purdue, they have a good chance to beat them because they move up and down the floor so quickly, and they have so many talented ball handlers like Jameer Nelson, Micah Peavy, Emmanuel Miller, all those guys. They have dudes that can take over games, hit big shots. So I think TCU wins this one and has a chance to beat Purdue in the round of 32. A lot of talk about Will Wade and McNeese State, right? One of the best records in the country. Um, now, <laughs> there's been a lot of jokes about McNeese State literally played a, a team called like the something women's Christian school or something. Yeah, it was like it was like Earlier Mississippi College year. of Women. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about McNeese State? I mean, obviously the schedule has not been uh, grueling, um, but it's also is it is it McNeese or McNeese? I you know I've called it McNeese, but I, it could very well could be McNeese. I think uh, it's McNeese. I, I don't yeah. know for sure, but I like McNeese better. It sounds better, honestly. It just flows better. Rhymes with McSneezy. Um, any, any thoughts on Gonzaga? I mean, I know you're a guy that likes this Gonzaga team as well. Um, but McNeese has been, you know, they've been kind of the, the national darling over the last few days. Do we think that continues here or do we like Gonzaga? Like you said, McNeese had literally one of the, I mean, they're 30 and three. They have one of the best records in college basketball. They also played like probably the worst schedule I've ever seen, at least in the non-conference. Mm-hmm. Gonzaga consistently makes it to Sweet 16s. They have Graham Ike. I think Will Wade is already looking for other for another team to coach, whether that's Oklahoma State, not Louisville, Ohio State, or whoever it is, they'll give them that next opportunity. I I think it's Gonzaga. They're a consistent team. They're not star led like they have been in the past, but they're still a really solid team. We're going with Gonzaga here, and you know it's it's when whenever you think that these you know lesser name teams that could be the potential cinderella are gonna pop that's when the it's chalk almost always um we got kansas and sanford next and this kansas team at one point in the season was one of the best teams in the country a lot of injuries um you know facing a sanford team that nobody knows much about oh i, I know some things i know some things okay let's hear some sanford stuff okay so sanford plays fast pace has the highest three point percentage of any team in college basketball i believe eight dudes not one not two not three not four not five not six not seven eight players on this bulldogs team shoot above 38 percent from three that is insane they have a dude that shoots 48 percent from three with a team that's shallow in depth no kevin mcculler jr hunter dickinson injured a really shallow rotation i believe they're playing at colorado they're yeah. playing somewhere in the west at elevation to me i i think sanford wins this one i honestly a lot of the 12 or 13 seeds that Kansas was going to get matched up against, I probably would have picked them anyway, just with how hurt they are and how bad they've looked. But yep. this Stamper team, 
has a chance to be a Sweet 16 darling easily with how well they shoot the ball? We're going with Sanford, and then we move down to South Carolina and Oregon. South Carolina, a team that nobody expected to do great uh, this season and ended up being very successful in the SEC. Got their coach a, a contract extension in year one, uh, a.k.a. year zero, facing an Oregon team that really just kind of went off in the Pac-12 tournament, was not a team that was in, uh, you know, ultimately made the bubble very uncomfortable for a lot of teams like a St. John's or an Indiana State. What do we think about Oregon and South Carolina? I have really no true opinions or thoughts on this game. Um, any takes on, on, on this matchup? I like Oregon. I think South Carolina overachieved a lot this season. I think they were coached really well by Lamont, by Lamont Paris, but I think Oregon's a better team. They've got tournament experience. Dana Altman has tournament experience, at least. I think it's Oregon. Then we have Creighton and Akron. Again, this Creighton team has been solid, gone under the radar all season, but they've been a really quality squad against an Akron team. Um, who, again, you know, when you get in, into teams like these 14 seeds like like Akron, uh, you know, they've not faced a whole lot of big-name teams, but the teams that they face that are NCAA tournament teams, Utah State lost by three, lost by 20 to Drake, uh, lost by two to UNLV, uh, lost by one to St. Bonaventure, uh, got pretty, pretty much handled by James Madison, split two games with Toledo. Uh, there's not a whole lot there with Akron. Do you like Creighton? I like Creighton. I mean, they were one of the best teams and one of the best conferences in college basketball, though the Big East only got three schools in. I think Akron's just not a very good team, if I'm being honest with you. I think it's Creighton. Yep, I agree. And that moves us to Texas and Colorado State. Um, you know, Texas made a surprising run last year under an uh, interim head coach, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, now that that now that he's in a full-time position, uh, we know that they'll be facing Colorado State. Um, Colorado State handled Virginia – on Tuesday night, uh, any thoughts about Colorado State keeping it going? Um, or is this... I, I think, I mean, Texas is a really talented team. But again, Texas should have lost to Louisville. And yep. anytime I see anybody play competitively with us this year, I automatically have my doubts. I think if there's anybody that's going to get hot from this first four, I think Colorado State can be it. Texas has talent, Max Asmus, and a lot of other guys. But I think Colorado State's the team that gets hot from the final four or from the I'm, first four. I'm sure he's Ram man now, but if they bring back Ram boy, I'm all I'm all about them just make it to the final four. If you remember back in the day when Louisville made their national championship run, it was the hot pick for people to pick Colorado State over Louisville. Mm -hmm. They gave Louisville a little bit of challenge back then. We move ahead 11 years. 11 years. It's been 11 years since that since that NCAA tournament run, believe it or not. Um, I, I think that we have them beating Texas. I think we're kind of in a consensus agreement here. Um, I, I do like, you know, Max Asmus had an NCAA tournament run a couple of years ago. That was really impressive. But ultimately, yeah, I think Colorado State gets it done here. Uh, we have St. Peter's, you know, the, the darlings that upset Kentucky uh, in that same season, I believe, right? Um, that, that Max Asmus was going off um, against Tennessee. Any thoughts on, on St. Saint, Saint Peter's versus Tennessee? Do you think Tennessee gets it done? I think Tennessee gets it done. They went to the Elite Eight two years ago. St. Peter's did. There is mm -hmm. like almost nobody on this team that did that played any significant minutes. I would be a great story if St. Peter's did it. Tennessee's too good. They're still defensively dominant and they've got offense. They've got offense now. Yeah, they they are an all around really solid squad. So that puts us back up against Purdue and your alma mater in TCU. Purdue, again, we have them winning for the first time in the tournament in a while. Um, they've been upset by a 10, 10 seed or higher in the last three NCAA tournaments. Um, does Purdue finally get it going, or um, do we like, you know, is TC, does TCU match up well with them? I'm going to let you make the pick. Purdue has better guards than they did in the past. I just, I mean, I'm going to pick TCU because I'm a homer, just the same way I would pick Louisville going to the Final Four when I was eight years old, no matter how bad they were, even <laughs> if they were a nine seed in the tournament. I would yeah. still have them go to the Final Four every year. I think TCU has a great chance. I think they match up well. They obviously don't have anyone that can guard Zach Eady, but Zach Eady cannot get up and down the floor the way TCU can. So I think that does give them an advantage, but I'm going to let you make the final call here. I think Purdue advances, and I think that if Purdue advances here, they have a really good shot of just ma making that run to the Final Four. I mean, they have such a good quality squad. 
it's just hard for me to imagine them getting out, you know, having such a great regular season once again, and then getting ousted once again. I, there's a lot of Virginia vibes there, right? When Virginia got beat in, in the first game of the tournament, they came back with this hunger and drive to make it happen the next year. I think, I think Purdue takes down TCU. I know it's making you uncomfortable. I can see, I can see the look on your face. Whatever, man. Um, but, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> then that moves us down to Gonzaga and Sanford. Um, you know, again, a Sanford team that you're really high on against a Gonzaga team that you're really high on. Uh, any thoughts there about how they match up? I think, uh, I mean, very different speed, three point shooting is Sanford. Gonzaga is more slow it down. Graham Mike is their best player. So they're more post dominant, more post oriented. I can see, I mean, this could all blow up in my face, but I think Sanford is the team that makes a surprise sweet 16 run and can test Purdue as well, honestly, because they teams that shoot like that, they're very unpredictable. They could lose in the first round very easily, but they Mm -hmm. can also just, you can't do anything like against when Drake played Indiana state last week, you couldn't do anything. Indiana state, they played a good basketball game. They just couldn't do anything because Drake wouldn't miss a shot. This is what Sanford can do as well. Yep, yep. So we got the Bulldogs taking down the Bulldogs, and that moves us down to Oregon versus Creighton. Again, an Oregon team that's been really hot versus a Creighton team that's just been consistent all season. Uh, they've been there, done that. Um, you know, a head coach that's been at Creighton for, what, 15 years now in McDermott. Uh, mm-hmm. What say you? I think it's Creighton. I watched him beat UConn by, like, 30 or 20 one of UConn's few losses. So I might be a little biased there, but I, I I think it's, I think I would go Creighton. Oregon is an okay squad that has gotten hot recently, but Creighton has some really impressive wins. None more impressive than whenever they beat UConn by what does it say? 19 there. Yeah. 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 So, so when, uh, uh, what what is that? 16. Um, but yeah, a 16 point win over UConn, uh, no, excuse me, excuse me. You're right. I'm sorry. A 19 point win over UConn. They also lost to UConn by 16 yeah, yeah. back in January, um, but they have you know really quality wins again over Marquette. Um, they have a quality win earlier in the season against Alabama. I like Creighton here. Um, so that moves us down to Tennessee and Colorado State. I think we'd both be in agreement that Tennessee would, would probably win this one. Yep, I think Tennessee's issue in the past has always been. They're so defensive oriented, kind of like Virginia. Then they get in these NCAA tournament games and they just don't have anyone that can score. They have don't connect now. They have probably the best score of the basketball in in the whole entire sport. Another dope ass white guy. What let's stay there with Creighton and Tennessee first. Um, what what do you think about Creighton, Tennessee? This is a really tough one. I think this is gonna be one of the tougher ones to pick. I, I could coin toss it and I'd be fine with you either way. I want to lean a little bit more Tennessee just because I know they have that defense. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they have that proven scoring ability with Dalton Connect. Creighton is a really solid team, too. So I'm fine coin flipping it here, letting you decide. Um, but I, if you're giving me a pick, I'd go Tennessee. I'm going Tennessee as well. I was just waiting for you to say it. Uh, <laughs> Purdue and Sanford. Um, again, you know, Sanford's our darling here out of this bracket. Purdue, you know, do they have to show us something first? before we pick them to make it to the elite eight. Um, what, 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 what's our thoughts here? I mean, I'm, I'm feeling crazy. I want to go Sanford. I understand that is not, that is probably not the correct pick whatsoever. I don't think they have one dude. Sanford has like one dude that's taller than six, nine that plays for them. So um, matching up against Zach Eady will be difficult. I think they obviously have a chance to beat almost anybody in this team with the way they can shoot the ball. I think Purdue probably gets it done. I, I think they have something to prove, kind of similar to a UVA run where so they were so you, embarrassed last year. If you're watching here on on YouTube, I have this pulled up for a reason, and this is something that I looked into previously. Purdue oh, wow. just absolutely waxed Sanford early in the season. Shoot. Now, again, teams are not the teams now that they were back on November the 6th when they played, which was one of their first games of the season. Uh, but Purdue took them down – 98 to 45. Jesus uh, Christ. See, Sanford will be I, hungry. Sanford will be hungry for sure. They'll be out for blood. The Bulldogs will be out for blood. I think it's Purdue here. And yeah, I really like good. that matchup of, of Purdue and Tennessee. I just, they, they picked the wrong region. I think if they want to, if, if they, you know, they, they already have those t- tough matchups with Kansas, uh, potentially Gonzaga or McNeese. I just don't think there's much gas left in the tank after that. 
Um, so then that leaves us for our final pick to go to the final four, Purdue versus Tennessee. What do we think? Tennessee. I mean, I, I, they ha- they have the size to match up. They've got Jonas to do. They have enough defense to be able to stop Purdue. And they've got the offense as well. So I, I think, wow, one, one, two, five. Not terrible. Better than yeah. most ESPN analysts that come out and it's one, 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 two, or one, 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 one. And you're like, wow, you you really went out on a limb there. Yeah. So that that five is St. Mary's, the one is UConn. Um, who do we have winning in our first final four game? I think it's UConn. I've made, like I said, a lot of brackets. I think in 80% of my brackets, I have UConn winning. It's so hard it's, to pick against them. It's yeah. really, really difficult to pick against them. I think they could lose against Auburn in that Sweet 16 matchup. I don't think there's anyone in that West bracket that beats UConn, whether it's St. Mary's, North Carolina, Arizona, whoever it is. So I think if UConn makes it to the Final Four, they will be in the championship game. And then we have Houston and Tennessee, a great matchup there. Two very defensively minded teams that can also get it done on, on both ends of the floor. Uh, do we like a, a Houston UConn matchup, or do you think Tennessee? This is finally Rick Barnes's time. I think I'm going to go Tennessee. They make the Final Four for the very first time ever. They have a little bit more offense than Houston has. Houston looked like garbage in the last time we saw them against Iowa State. They lost by 28. Good teams that win national championships do not lose by that much. I think the last time a national champion lost by that much was 2014 UConn when Louisville yeah. beat them by like 27, 28 in the first right. round of the Big East tournament. And then they just went on an ape shit run. Right. So to me, great teams don't get beat that badly. So I'm going to go Tennessee. So we have Tennessee and UConn for all the marbles. Do we think that UConn gets it done once again? I think so. I, okay. I, I really think so. I mean, they're just the yeah. most complete team, the most experienced team on offense. They do it on defense. They do it. They've got a great coach. They've got everything a team needs to win a back-to-back national championship. So we got UConn defeating Tennessee, a, f- a final four of UConn, St. Mary's, Houston, and Tennessee. Guys, get involved in the State of Louisville Bracket Challenge. We have some pretty solid giveaways. Uh, it's going to be winner take all. So I suspect that it'll be probably down to – it'll go down to the last day of the State of Louisville Tournament Challenge, which is how we set it up. That's how we want it to be. Um, Make sure that you get signed up. And thank you again to our sponsors, Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, uh, Frankfurt Avenue Liquors, and, of course, our buddies over at T-Shirt Hooligan uh, who help us help, help us with all of our merch. Uh, that's going to do it for us uh, for now. Until next time, starting 502 Podcast, we probably have a lot more coming for you guys. Uh, until next time, let's get out of here.